Probably. This is like a surgery where you, the guy's already dead. <laughs> <laughs> you just keep. <laughs> So I'm here at DTU, I'm doing a master's and this January I took a three week course on experimental fluid mechanics. I took it with my friends. It was a very nice course uh, during the first few weeks. We did some experiments, uh, it was very cool. Uh, but my favorite part was during the last week, um, we were doing an activity called uh, flow visualization. Basically it was, uh, we were separated into groups and each group had to decide whatever they want to visualize. And we had freedom on anything. It could be any flow in any regime, anything. Uh, obviously re restricted by the lab equipment and the time that we had. After some discussion with my group and some ideas, we decided to come up with a uh, huge show visualization cells, uh, which is what this video is about. So what's that? Okay, the setup is very simple. Uh, basically you have two flat plates uh, separated by a small gap, somewhere in the order of 0.5 millimeters, somewhere around that, and uh, you would have an obstacle, an obstacle in between. Uh, it could be a cross section of whatever you want, a cylinder, an airfoil, a cow, whatever. And then you would just have some fluid going around it, and if you look at it from the top, you would get the two-dimensional flow around that object. And well, it, it's it's very cool. You're gonna see it. Okay, so the first thing that we had to do was to design and build the apparatus. Uh, for that, we did the calculations for the geometry in order to get a reasonable speed during the experiment. And the Reynolds number that we aimed for was around 10. After that, we proceed to do the CAD design and then we laser cut it. With respect to the materials, uh, the plates must be transparent, which is why we decided to cut them in plexiglass. And with respect to the parts that go in the middle, we decided to use uh, plastic. So the seal and the cross sections of the figures that we're using, they're made of plastic. And after a few hours, this is the result. Wow. Yeah, now it's there really cool. Goes. Yes, yes, yes. That's cool. That's cool. What we have it. Okay. Something very interesting about this experiment, it's in my opinion from the theoretical point of view. So the experiment is meant to be happening at very low Reynolds numbers. The velocity is very small and the length scales are also very small, meaning that Reynolds is very small. When you have a very small Reynolds, less than one, ideally, you get something that we call a Stokes flow, um, which is basically a simplification of the governing equations, a simplification of Navier-Stokes, in which uh, the nonlinear term, the acceleration term, the inertial terms, they go to zero. They are very small compared to the others, so you can just ignore them. If you do that, what you're left with is basically a balance of forces equals zero. In this case, you would be balancing pressure gradients, um, uh, gravity, because this is a small gradient, and uh, viscosity, of course. Uh, when you do the math for the setup that we have, it turns out that the velocity field is being governed by a Laplace equation. That's very good news. Uh, Laplace equation, we know how to solve it, it's very smooth, relatively easy to compute, well behaved, and it looks beautiful. That's The solution to a Laplace equation is what you look 
uh, when you look at the streamlines that that are on video. So pretty cool. Um, however, the interesting part comes when you analyze the flow in the other side of the spectrum. So if you think about Reynolds, you would have very low Reynolds laminar, you start increasing, you hit some transition, you increase even more, you have turbulent flow. So the key about uh, the flow and turbulent flow is that you would have a boundary layer and the higher the Reynolds, the thinner the boundary layer. And what's very nice is that outside the boundary layer, the uh, viscosity effects are not very important. So you can just ignore them and you have an inviscid flow outside the boundary layer at a very high Reynolds number. Uh, okay, what does that even mean? Okay, if there is no viscosity, it means that there is no curl in the velocity field. So the curl of the velocity field equals zero. And if you are considering that your flow is incompressible, which is a very common assumption, uh, depending on the Mach number, but slow Mach numbers, that, that's fine. Um, small Mach numbers. Uh, then you would have a flow that has divergence equal zero. So divergence and curl equal, equal zero that turns out that that obeys a Laplace equation. So your velocity field in a very high Reynolds numbers outside boundary layer is the same as the Stokes case. So let, let me say that again. The flow at a very low Reynolds number and at a very high Reynolds number outside boundary layers are governed by the same equation. They look the same. That's freaking amazing, mind-blowing. It looks like a paradox. It's not, we've checked the map. It's right. Uh, <laughs> this setup is working with low Reynolds numbers and it's letting you know the solution that you would get from an ideal or potential flow, which is how we call it, the, 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 the high Reynolds one. That's amazing. And that, that's how it, the, the, this experiment is advertised. You, you see potential flow visualization, which is right, but holy shit, that's amazing. You are not getting potential flow, but you are getting potential flow. I love it. Okay, now look at those flows. Oh my God, they're gorgeous, aren't they? Uh, first here we have a uh, flow around an airfoil, an ACA 0024. Uh, that's a symmetric airfoil at a zero angle of attack, which is supposed to produce no lift. Uh, this is verified by looking at the streak lines. They are symmetric uh, above and below the profile. And uh, we deliberately chose a fat profile so that the deflection of the streak lines was a bit more noticeable. Okay, now look at this one. This one is obviously different. Uh, this is an AK9410, and the main difference from the previous one is that this airfoil, uh, its geometry has a large camber, and uh, well, it's positioned with a small but positive angle of attack with respect to the flow. What that means is that it should be producing lift, and it is. I mean, you can check that by looking at the streak lines. They're being deflected downwards, and that happens both above and below the profile. And well, you know, if the water is being pushed downwards, is it means that there should be a positive or an upwards force around the profile. That's a positive lift. And now, now look, look at how the streak lines are being deflected around the tail. Oh my God! That is beautiful. That that's brilliant. That's that's definitely brilliant. I, I mean, just, I mean, you see this on computers, but seeing it face to face is just pff, amazing. And by the way, isn't it amazing how you can tell part of the story of the pressure field just by looking at the streamlines around the object? I've always thought that that's very cool.
Okay, so not, not everything is sunshine and rainbows. Um, there was a problem with this experimental setup. The main problem was uh, air bubbles. If you have done experimental fluid mechanics, you have you know that air bubbles are a pain in the ass. Uh, basically, the problem is that uh, well, you have your setup and you are starting to pour the water. It's filling the space. You ideally would just get only water in the object, um, and for that, the air is being displaced outside of the of the setup. Uh, however, if you have uh, an object, uh, an obstacle which is not very aerodynamic, let's think about a cylinder. You would have the water come in, it goes around the cylinder, and then right here in the wake, it forms an air bubble. So once it is formed, it's very difficult to take it out. And um, yes, I mean, you have air bubbles. Now you have not the flow around the cylinder, but the flow around the cylinder plus a bubble, uh, which is not what you want. You cannot control it. That's not what you're looking for. How do you fix that? Well, I'm pretty sure that there's gotta be several tricks that you could use. Um, the one that we came up with is, um, we were thinking, why is it difficult for the water to get in that place in the first place? And well, it has to do with the pressure field, but also with uh, the fact that there is some surface tension that's preventing the water to get there. So if you were to reduce the surface tension of the fluid, uh, it would be easier to fill those cavities. Okay, how do you reduce the surface tension of water? There's a very simple trick that they teach you in a basic course in fluid mechanics, which is you just add soap. There's a very simple experiment about that. You add soap, the um, uh, surface tension decreases, and that, that's it. And, and you don't even have to add a lot of soap, just a little bit. Uh, we did that. It was very fast, very simple. We add some soap, and the problem was solved. I mean, it still required some tricks, um, but it solved it for the most part. Uh, it was great. And what I liked the most about that idea was that the surface tension trick with the soap is something that they teach you in class and is actually useful. Who would have thought? Now, as you can see, there was an outstanding side effect when we added soap. Soap bubbles, of course. Uh, but wait, weren't we supposed to avoid bubbles? Well, yes, we wanted to avoid the big evil air bubbles that were stuck around the object. However, these tiny little soap bubbles, they are going with the flow, which is good. And, and yeah, well, even though they could be big enough to have some effect on the velocity field, uh, they also give us an idea of the magnitude of the velocity, which is great. It's kind of like a particle tracking velocity measurement. And uh, yes, uh, we got this completely by accident, but uh, pretty cool. huh? And something extremely cool that could be seen with these bubbles is how the flow accelerates when it gets closer to the body where the curvature of the velocity field is higher and then it decelerates when it has passed the body. It's pretty cool. I mean, look at look at how the bubbles accelerate and decelerate around the body. Oh god. Okay, this one is a very good single example. It gets closer to the body, look at the bubble, it accelerates, accelerates and it goes to the wake, it decelerates and it keeps going with the flow. There's another one, gets closer, accelerates and then it slowly decelerates and goes with the rest of the flow. With regard to the cylinder, well this is the classical example for this experiment. And here you can see a comparison between our experiment and the theory. The theory being a solution of a Laplace equation around the cylinder. As you can see, they're almost identical. However, if you have been paying attention, you have noticed by now that the Stokes flow assumes a small Reynolds number, less than 1. Uh, but our experiment has a Reynolds number of around 10. So, well, is this a good enough approximation? Well, kind of. A Reynolds number of 10 is still pretty small, definitely laminar. But if you are going to do some kind of quantitative study with this experiment, you may have to consider some of the acceleration terms that we previously neglected. 
A simple way to do this is just with a first order approximation uh, of these terms uh, as it is done in the O scenes correction. That should do the trick. Now for this uh, drop shape. It's a bit similar to the airfoils, but a bit more aggressive. You can see the deflection of the uh, streak lines. You can also see the movement of the bubbles, how they accelerate and then decelerate. And you can also see a little bit how the soap and the bubbles are being accumulated in the wake due to it being a low pressure zone. Pretty neat. And now for the main event. A cow. A beautiful cow. I mean, look at those streamlines around the cow. <laughs> oh my god, I cannot believe we actually we actually did this. It's amazing. By the way, it was such a problem to get this flow. The cow is very, very much not an aerodynamic object. And it's pretty useful, huh? This would be the representation of a flying cow around a low Reynolds number flow. Pretty useful, right? Oh, but definitely beautiful. And of course, I'm going to answer the mandatory question. Why on earth did you choose a cow? Well, for the memes, of course. I mean, if you look for the aerodynamics of a cow in Google, you will find that there are a lot of CFD simulations of a cow. Not because it is useful, but just because we can. And it was relatively simple to just print a cow and put it in the hill show experiment. So, yeah, we did it. And about the air bubbles, yes, they disturb the experiment, but you can also get some pretty cool looking things. Like for example, look at this, the flow around the contraction. Or, I don't know, maybe you can even get the cow with a fart. Cool, right? Okay, so obviously you saw it, it worked. It was pretty cool and we had a lot of fun. Uh, I didn't even include like the two, three hours of bloopers and we laughing in the lab that I have. Uh, but yeah, it was great. Uh, if you liked it and you want to know more about perhaps the experiment or the theory, I don't know, Stokes flow, uh, potential flow, uh, surface tension, any of that you can find in any introductory book to fluid mechanics, like a general book in fluid mechanics. Uh, in our case, we used uh, this one, uh, Fluid Mechanics uh, by Kundu, 6th edition. I'm going to put the reference to this one in the description uh, if you just want to check it out. Uh, I'm pretty sure this could be found in almost any other book for fluid mechanics. Uh, it's pretty basic, but uh, yeah. Uh, it's very, very nice, even though you are not dealing with turbulence and complicated terms. Uh, it's simple, but it's beautiful. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it, uh, and have a good day. Holy shit, I don't know. What, what the fuck? No, it, no it's not. <laughs>